Watch them grow They'll learn much more 
do it justice, but welcome to a meeting of the Humanist Hub community. The Humanist Hub, this, this space in which we're spending time right now, uh, is one of the first ever spaces specifically designed as a center for humanist life. It's a place where free-thinking, humanistic, agnostic, atheist, secular, and other fellow traveling people can come together to connect, act, and evolve. We're a collection of communities that believe people connecting to our fellow human beings is one of the most profound ways to create a meaningful life. We believe in helping one another to act on our convictions, live out our values. We believe in evolution, not just in the sense of celebrating reason and science and even Darwin Day, which we actually do celebrate here every year, but we also sincerely hope to evolve as human beings, as a society, over the course of this one and only life that we'll ever have. To do that, we here have already begun in just a few weeks since we've moved in to combine music and art, inspiring talks, uh, interfaith outreach, service to those less fortunate, and education to help people of all ages grow into a community. Okay. So that description um, of this space is something that we hope and believe that you'll be able to hear uh, every Sunday for the next several years. Not to mention many other days and nights that the space has already begun to bustle. But, as I said a few moments, a moments ago, this is a special, bittersweet occasion for everybody who's part of this community. Everything that you see around you is the ongoing, evolving product of the humanist community at Harvard, originally the humanist chaplaincy at Harvard, a nonprofit organization founded in 1974, originally to serve students at Harvard, by one Thomas Ferrick. The founder of this organization, Thomas Varick, died in late December after just about 40 years of service to us. And while I would hesitate to uh, define this space as a promised land, it's, uh, it's a beautiful step forward that represents the hopes and the efforts of hundreds probably thousands of people that could, poss could not possibly exist. This, this space, this community, this set of connections and love could not possibly exist if it wasn't for Tom. So today, we've gathered to mark Tom's passing and to honor his life. I met Tom almost exactly 14 years ago today. And 
I knew right away that his amazing life would completely transform mine. I, I can't express uh, what an honor it's been for me to succeed him as the humanist chaplain at Harvard. I, uh, were I to even try to describe that to you, I would really end up speechless. And I, I do think that Tom would enjoy having rendered me speechless. He would, he would get a little, little pleasure. I, I shut that kid up. Um, so I'm beyond honored to help moderate this service um, in his memory. And what we're going to do today is we're going to hear some reflections um, from people who knew him best. Uh, we won't even be able to invite half of those who knew him best uh, up to speak, and, and we know that, and there's just so much to say. But uh, afterwards, there will be time. There will be a bite to eat. Uh, there will be time for sharing stories. And um, I should add that as Tom helped train me, uh, often when we do a humanist memorial service, there will be somebody, perhaps like myself, to help recount the deceased person's life from beginning to end. And we won't exactly be doing that today. It's, we're all going to be, all of us, a, a little bit like the proverbial blindfolded man, uh, feeling different parts of the wise old elephant. Um, but sometimes when an individual's life has been so varied and so rich and so long, that's all but natural. Uh, it's hard for any individual to do him justice, but I will say uh, that we're excited. We've got a special treat for those who are interested after the service, um, after we've had a bite to eat and just given people a chance to share stories. Um, on the televisions here, Tom used to do a cable access television show called The Humanist Connection, uh, about every month or so. And um, on episode 33, of the Humanist Connection, uh, instead of having his traditional guest speaker, uh, he told his life story. And we have that story on DVD uh, right here, and we're going to play it again later in the afternoon for, for any who are interested. And if you're not able to stick around for that, uh, we're planning on putting the, the DVD up on our website for people to view anytime they wish. Um, and we're really excited about that. He, he told the story uh, in his late 60s. And I'll, I'll leave the rest for later. Uh, finally, I, I just want to say that we, of course, intend no disrespect to um, any of those of Tom's family or friends or colleagues who consider themselves to have religious beliefs. Uh, time will be provided later for silent reflection. So we really hope and believe that you'll find the occasion dignified and acceptable. And I'm just so glad that you could be here with us today. So, um, in our Sunday gatherings that we've begun to have here, we have a tradition that after opening remarks, might have been a bit long, um, we uh, will invite somebody up to give a poetic reflection. And to do that today, I'd like to invite uh, the program director, one of the many gifted young professionals who follow in Tom's footsteps, uh, Sarah Chandonet, to give a reflection. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Sarah Chandonet. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I've worked at the humanist community at Harvard in a number of different roles uh, for the last five years. Um, Tom was actually on the board of directors that hired me back in 2009 and really enabled me to begin my career in the humanist movement. So I chose to read this poem today on behalf of the whole HCH staff because I know that we see Tom in all of the work that we do here every day, and it's in gratitude that we're able to reflect on his life. Do not come when I am dead to sit beside a low green mound or bring the first gay daffodils because I love you so, for I shall not be there. You cannot find me there. I will look up at you from the eyes of children. I will bend to meet you in the swaying boughs of bud-filled trees and caress you with a passionate sweep of storm-filled winds. I will give you strength in your upward tread of everlasting hills. I will cool your tired body in the flow of the limpid river. I will warm your work-glorified hands through the glow of winter fire. I will soothe you into forgetfulness to the drop 
drop of rain on the roof. I will speak to you out of the rhymes of the masters, and I will dance with you in the lilt of the violin, and make your heart leap with the bursting cadence of the organ. I will flood your soul with the flaming radiance of the sunrise, and bring you in the tender rose and gold of the after sunset. All these have made me happy. They are part of me, and I shall become part of them. For our first reflection, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Ellery Shemp, who uh, is one of the most admired and respected uh, humanist leaders locally and around the country, and somebody that Tom greatly admired. And so I think it's only appropriate to have you begin. Thank you, Greg. Well, it's a rather distinguished audience that comes together this day to remember Tom and to appreciate what he has done to advance humanistic outlooks and values. I have a bit of a famous name in legal circles, circles about a Supreme Court decision about Bible reading and prayer in the public schools, and I've been happy to have been an advocate for humanists and non-believers and separation of church and state for more than 50 years now. But I never did anything quite by myself in the Supreme Court case. It was the ACLU and their attorney. That was back in the years 1956-63. And then oh, in the years after, I was busy doing physics. Well, so a Supreme Court decision is neat, but daily helping, confronting, and caring is an entirely different contribution. And that is truly Tom's gift to us all. Forty years ago, when Tom began working at Harvard in 1974, I was totally unaware of him and his later significance. I was late to the game. But in the years from 1998 or so, 15 years ago maybe, I came to know what a wonderful man Tom was and the special role that he had in promoting secular and humanist values. The Boston Globe wrote, in a little bit snarky way I think, uh, quote, although he traded godliness for godlessness when he left the priesthood and became a prominent humanist leader in greater Boston, Mr. Farrick spent his tenure advocating for bringing a spectrum of denominations into Harvard's chaplaincy. Well, good for him. <laughs> I, wish, I wish Tom could hear us. The best memorial services are for those who are still alive. I suggest to all of you that you have your memorials before you die. <laughs> you are probably more wonderful than you think, especially if you are a humanist. Well, Tom will not hear any words we speak today, and that is sad, because the last time Arlene and I visited him, he was unaware of the admiration we, gave, we give him today. He had difficulty in focusing at that time. I mentioned the wonderful, astonishing, and vital role that he played in establishing humanism and a humanist secular chaplaincy. He said, really? Did I do that? <laughs> well, yes, he most certainly did. And we cannot count the number of students who benefited from Tom's wise and caring counseling over his 40 years at Harvard. Tom also promoted the Boston Area Humanist, and this is how I came to know Tom. He invited me to speak to the Boston Area Humanist several times, the Brooks House on the campus. Boston Humanists are now a thriving group with the support of Joe Gerstein, Stuart um, and Greg Epstein, and many others, and every meeting of Boston Humanists is part of Tom's legacy. Can any one of us grasp Tom's internal fortitude and courage to leave the priesthood and challenge all churchly and biblical authority, facing isolation and struggling in his own mind what to think, what to believe, and how we are to be good humans to and for all of us? Tom did know the Bible backwards and forwards, but he doubted its moral authority. This took guts. Tom was slight of build and soft-spoken, but his courage in the face of many risks was awesome, and maybe we could all take away some kernel of Tom in our lives. There are dozens of people here who should be recognized, especially Joe Gerstein, John Loeb, Greg Epstein. John Loeb, the Harvard alumnus, gave an $800,000 gift to endow the humanist chaplaincy. So without him, I don't think the whole thing would have ever uh, gotten off the ground. And Joe and Barbara Gerstein provided vital support for Tom <coughs> after he left Harvard. And they deserve special recognition for their generosity and their time and attention. <coughs> and Greg Epstein, who was Tom's successor, there was some famous situation where a pioneer died, and the person who succeeded him said, I cannot replace him. I merely come after. Well, Greg is in fact enlarging on Tom's legacy in a great and wonderful way. Tom was right in encouraging Greg to take over after he had to leave. Tom cannot be replaced, but he will be forever remembered. 
well, I think we'll have time later to have a moment of reflection on the life and thought of Tom Ferrick and, and how he graced our values and enhanced our commitments. Humanists, non-believers, as well as fundamentalists come and go, living and dying is such for us humans. Tom's legacy to all of us here today is to remember and how his life became part of ours. I imagine that Tom would like us to carry with, his, with us a few thoughts. He surely would like us to die like him after a life well lived. He surely would like us to dance and sing, even though he always felt a bit awkward. And Tom taught us that biblical authority was a poor source of ethical behavior. So we can all have admiration for what Tom brought to us, and every humanist chaplain who comes after him will build on a foundation that Tom started in every college in the country. So I would offer this reminder to go forth and do good without God, and be of exceeding great joy that Tom Ferrick was among us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Valerie. That was wonderful. Um, so uh, next we'll have Stuart Wamsley. Stuart, um, I've known you to be a stalwart of this community since I've been involved, and I know that's even before. Um, you, to me, represent uh, someone who was in complete solidarity and friendship with Tom in the last couple of decades of his life, and so glad you could be here to speak. Thank you, Greg. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm, I'm the treasurer of the Greater Boston Humanist, and I've been on the board with Tom for many years. Um, the humanist movement has always, always been openly supportive of the gay rights movement, the movement for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender equality. Tom Ferrick was a gay man who lived through and worked for all the advances, the great advances, of both struggles over the past five decades. I first approached him and Greater Boston Humanists, Ham at the time, in the 1990s because I wanted to make sure I had a gay humanist celebrant as I made my first will. He understood my fear that my life would be whitewashed over by bereaved relatives as an atheist, a humanist, a gay man. Not in this community. He happily agreed. Tom was extremely discreet, a professor and a gentleman of the old school. It's only later that I was privileged to spend much time with him. He was always busy, warmly welcoming every new or returning group member or student as he worked at his myriad <coughs> duties, advocating eloquently for the philosophy of humanism. As a board member of Greater Boston Humanists, I had time with him over the past 10 years to share some of my personal struggles, and he offered advice with the thoughtful, loving reserve that you would expect from a gentle priest, at least as I imagine such things. He and I went together to see Brokeback Mountain, another sign of the cultural breakthrough that had us both in tears, discreetly of course. He lived as we've heard like a monk, or as we will hear, he was extremely, uh, he had a simple lifestyle. Uh, I never really knew all that much about his private life or shared much in it. I knew he was proudly gay and happy to have partners and a group of close gay friends, some of whom are here today. His memory was prodigious. Not only did he follow every new intellectual, he seemed to know everyone on our mailing list, personally, <laughs> to know something about them all. Likewise with the National Humanist Movement of the AHA, which he'd been involved in all his adult life. This was family for him and he loved each of us. This was his open, loving, intellectually satisfying, and compassionate community. It was also his life's work. He couldn't let go of this sense of duty. Despite retirement, even in his dignified decline at luxurious Neville Place with advancing Alzheimer's, he occasionally hallucinated meetings he was about to lead or bishops who were calling in the middle of the night to ask him to fly to Belgium for an audience with the humanists. <laughs> in his late, lucid moments, 
He could bring his sharp intellect to bear, though, on the world's development as much as any man, and with all the compassion for the world that he sometimes lacked for himself. He wished for death to come, rather than live in the mental confusion of his age. Towards the end, I was amazed that despite the blissful forgetfulness that sometimes led to not knowing who he was, all his friendly, professorial, empathetic politesse was still intact. These are habits that do not die. Thank you. So another dimension of Tom's life, as Stuart mentioned, uh, was his life as a gay man in, in an era in which it wasn't so easy to be one. Um, I'll never forget when Tom came back from a seeing Brokeback Mountain for the first time. He, he, he was so stunned by the movie. He, he wept and he ended up giving a speech at the New York Society for Ethical Culture a few weeks later that, uh, as I understand, there was not a dry eye in the house because of the the gratitude, the surprise that he felt uh, for the changes that have occurred in society. Um, so I just wanted to invite uh, Frank Gillespie next. Frank, uh, you represent one of many friends of Tom, uh, one of many people that he touched in his private life, um, and I'd just love to have you speak to that in any way that you see fit. Thank you. Welcome again to the remembering and honoring of a good man. Tom and his wisdom left the Roman Catholic priesthood back in 1969. And that was the very year I, in my limited Irish wisdom, was ordained to the Roman Catholic priesthood. <laughs> In the early 80s, Tom welcomed me into his intelligence, his challenge to religion, his comfort in being a non-theist, and to his Saturday morning philosophy group at Harvard, even though it was well above my brain power. <laughs> and we gay men invited Tom to our Sunday morning brunches, which he delighted in. Thank you, Tom. Death is difficult for us human beings, and so it ought to be, because we have a wondrous, wondrous capacity to draw close to each other. And saying goodbye is seldom easy. Thank you, Tom. I miss you. His gift to me was his encouragement to develop an intellectual curiosity and to speak with strong voice against injustice and to challenge authority. I remember some years ago, before I went to Ireland to attend my, nephew, my nephew's wedding, Connor, my nephew, invited me to share a reading, and Tom recommended a poem from one of his favorite poets. Scaffolding by Seamus Heaney. It was meant to clear up a row between Seamus Heaney and his <clears throat> wife. It's about building a relationship, the stages of a relationship and love. Tom, if I may. Masons, when they start upon a building, are careful to test out the scaffolding. Make sure that planks won't slip at busy points. Secure all ladders, tighten bolted joints. And yet all this comes down when the job's done, showing off walls of sure and solid stone. So if, my dear, there sometimes seems to be old bridges breaking between you and me, Never fear, we may let the scaffolds fall, confident that we have built 
our war. Tom built those scaffolds for us. You have made the building strong. And may we all, in our knowledge of him among ourselves, bow to his graciousness, graciousness and declare his life a success. His work continues. And may we cross that bridge to justice, to compassion, and inclusion for all, as we dedicate ourselves to spend our measure of love as he so gallantly did. Again, there are dimensions that we won't even get to today. Um, we have a wonderful gathering of Tom's family, and um, wasn't, I wasn't even aware uh, until very recently that so many of you were going to be able to be with us. So I just want to say, uh, again, thank you, and, and I acknowledge you. And I, I, I really, when I saw you here, uh, I, I, it, it really, thank you for being here. Um, thank you. And, um, and then there were all these other chapters. Um, there was, uh, there is a, a, a gentleman um, who is still um, a humanist leader who was one of Tom's students at Dartmouth College, uh, who lives in Chicago, couldn't be with us today. But you know, there are all these eras, all these important moments. Um, one that I want to speak to, is, uh, his name is Greg Stone. Um, if you uh, take a look outside of the main gathering room uh, by the elevator, uh, there are a lot of photos of Tom. Um, really beautiful memories, and uh, some of them are uh, wedding photos. And this one wedding photo that we'll uh, show you today is from Greg. Stone, who uh, was Harvard class of 75, um, and just represents one of a, a couple hundred couples, at least, that Tom performed a ceremony for. And he really loved bringing people together. And I thank you for being here to help us uh, reflect on that. Um, I was going to say that um, all of you in this room know Tom well, but he married me. <laughs> and uh, isn't it uh, wonderful that we live in a state where that statement can be confusing? Uh, you know, my lovely wife Mary is here, and uh, we were raised Catholic, although we're a lapsed, capital L. And uh, we had both been married before. And as we contemplated our ceremony, it became increasingly clear to us that the Catholic Church would not accept us as in holy matrimony. Now, I come from an Italian family in New Jersey, and I have a cousin by the name of Salvatore Buzicchio, who is father of Salvatore Buzicchio. And I called him up and I said, Sal, I need your help. He said, what's up, Greg? I said, can you do anything for us? Can you pull some strings? He said. Forget about it. <laughs> you have to apply to Rome through the canon courts, which was more than we wanted to do. So since Mary and I both went to Harvard, we rooted around and we landed uh, in Tom's lap. So he was very welcoming. Um, he was very wise. He was very gentle. And uh, I admired him from the get-go because he said that he had been uh, the Catholic chaplain at Dartmouth. And he said students were coming to him for advice about their faith, their questions about the war in Vietnam. I mean, God forbid we should question a war. Um, about their religion, questions about abortion. And he said he was increasingly unable to counsel them because he had so many doubts himself. So that kind of resonated with us. By the way, um, a funny note, um, the humanist connection Tom had us on that show, and we were supposed to be there with another couple. At the last minute, the other couple bowed out. <laughs> so Mary and I had talked to Tom for an hour, 
<laughs> I don't know how we filled the time, but I guess we did. We did. He never invited us back. But. <laughs> So, uh, in any case, uh, I, I always thought that Tom was a little bit like a secular saint. He mentioned at that time that he was living, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, on about $7,000 a year, which is about what Mary and I were living on at the time <laughs> when I started my business. But uh, he was sort of like St. Francis of Assisi, although I don't think he walked around barefoot in the snow, although that's something that Tom might have done. So, anyway, um, thank you for inviting me. Um, Mary and I now have celebrated 24 years together. We have two gorgeous children, and we owe it to Tom. So he did. He, he, he challenged uh, it was the 1950s, and he challenged the church's treatment of women and gays. He questioned notions of original sin and redemption. Um, as a Catholic chaplain at Dartmouth, he uh, gave sermons against the Vietnam War and got involved in the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, but then he uh, took courses uh, in the philosophy of religion at Columbia as he began to realize what, what the reality of his life and his philosophy might be. Um, he met members of the Ethical Culture Society there. That got him started on a new path. Um, and the Ethical Culture Society welcomed him. He spent a year uh, as the assistant leader of the Ethical Society of St. Louis, um, then moving to Boston and became the leader of the Ethical Society of Boston in 1971. Um, and in 1974, arrived at Harvard. Um, he, <clears throat> um, he arrived at Harvard with uh, support that he had asked for, it was hard for him, uh, from the American Humanist Association and the American Ethical Union. Tom didn't like to ask for help in that way. It was hard for him, like I said. He, um, um, he once, uh, he had a letter that I once saw um, saying that the status of the humanist chaplaincy is like a drowning man treading water. This is around 1978, 79 or so. Um, because it was hard, it was hard, it's hard to build anything new. And although Tom didn't see himself uh, as a builder necessarily, at least not in his, as, sort of a pri as, as a sort of primary identity. He built something. He built something really significant um, that affected all of us and that would affect a broader movement in ways that we'll hear more about later. Uh, but to represent the fact that Tom was a builder and he was not alone in building, he was part of a movement that, that really saw itself and <coughs> sees itself as trying to do some truly significant work in the world. I, uh, I'm gonna invite next Dave Niosi, who is the immediate past president of the American Humanist Association. And Tom loved these institutions that he was a part of, the American Ethical Union, and perhaps in particular, the American Humanist Association. He saw it as a real uh, bastion of reason and of his values, and he was a board member. He was president of its Humanist Society, and it's such an important chapter in his life. And Dave, he'd be very, very happy that you could be here to represent that. Yeah. Thank you, Greg. It really is an honor to be here to say a few words about Tom and my connection to him. He certainly affected my life in a very profound way. He was a good friend and uh, just a real gentleman in so many ways. Uh, Tom was one of the first people that I met when I got active in the humanist movement uh, about 10 years ago now. Uh, I was told that he was Harvard's humanist chaplain. And for somebody who doesn't come from the Harvard environment, that was very intimidating. I was thinking, oh my goodness, the Harvard's humanist chaplain. And, but when I finally met Tom, we had lunch in Harvard Square, as we would do many times over the years. I found this uh, humble, gentle man who was anything but intimidating. He was just so welcoming and so warm and 
such a willing mentor to me. Uh, I was really moved by that. And uh, we worked together quite a bit over the years, especially the first few years when I uh, first got to know Tom. He helped start the Worcester AHA chapter, for one thing. We, uh, at, back in those days, uh, the Humanist Association of Massachusetts was the only AHA chapter in Massachusetts, thus the name Humanist Association of Massachusetts. But we got the Worcester chapter up and running, and then a couple more chapters popped up in the years subsequent to that. So the Humanist Association of Massachusetts had to become Greater Boston Humanist because it kind of showed the growth of the movement locally uh, that Tom very much helped start. In fact, he was our first guest speaker at Greater Worcester Humanist. So that was a big deal to us to have Harvard's Humanist chaplain out to Worcester. So. I joined the American Humanist Association board in 2005 just as Tom was leaving. He kind of passed the baton to me and we used to joke that ours was the Boston seat on the AHA board. He uh, was very glad uh, to pass the baton. He was uh, on the board for I think eight years straight and he was on it prior to that as well. And he was very well uh, loved by everyone on the AHA board. He was very respected. He was known for being just the person that we all knew him as, just a, a kind, gentle man who was always willing to lend a hand and always willing to help. I just want to share one anecdote with uh, my experience with Tom, which really illustrates exactly the kind of person he was. When I first got involved in the humanist movement, uh, like a lot of people, uh, younger people getting involved in the secular movement, I was very gung-ho. I, I really wanted to uh, engage in the culture wars and just re really, you know, get into it. And uh, I had a little bit of a streak in me, like a lot of younger people in the secular movement do, uh, of being a little bit anti-religious and certainly uh, annoyed by unnecessary religious language in, in society. And there was one person in my life in particular at that time who was always saying, God bless me, or God bless you to me. Uh, and it was constant, not just when I sneezed either, but constantly, constantly uh, you know, God bless you, David, God bless you. And I, I explained this to Tom. I said, you know, it's really so annoying. How does, why does she assume that I want to be blessed? And Tom being Tom, he, he says to me, you know, David, uh, when somebody says God bless you to you, you could see it as an act of kindness. And, and uh, it really hit home with me. Well, of course, you know, duh. Uh, the, 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 this woman was not being hostile to me by saying, God bless you to me. She, but, you know, the secular activist in me wanted to see it that way. But, of course, uh, Tom was absolutely right. To me, that, that really showed who Tom was. The essence of Tom Ferrick was a kind man who really understood the good in people and never assumed the bad in people. And that's what I take away from Tom. That's how I remember him, and I'm sure that's how many of you remember him as well. Thank you.